I've been kind of doing the IT thing for about 25 years. Um, for my PhD, I looked at um, the psychology of collaborative software development. So I kind of found this slightly strange blend of IT and psychology. And about three years ago, maybe a little bit more, um, my eldest son was diagnosed with autism. And because I like facts a lot, as soon as he got his diagnosis, I was like, I need to be autism person. Right? I've got to find out everything there is to know about autism. So I went and read every book I could lay my hands on. I looked at every, um, uh, I, I looked at every kind of um, bit, of, bit of talk that somebody had given. Um, I went to meetings. I did training courses and all that kind of stuff. And the more I looked into my son's autism, the more I saw mirrors of myself. The more I saw behaviors that I thought, oh, hang on a minute, I do that. Hang on a minute, I'm a bit like that. Um, and so, uh, I'm pretty lucky. My sister's a clinical psychologist, uh, not an autism specialist, but she is a clinical psychologist. So, I phoned her up. She's very sweet, my sister, and I said, Tess, Tess, uh, Zach's got this diagnosis. I've been doing all this studying about stuff, and I realized I think I might be autistic. Do you think I am? And my sister paused and very politely said, well, you know, uh, hmm, I don't know if you get a diagnosis or not, because that's not my field, but you've definitely got traits. So now I kind of um, self-identify as somebody Aspergic or um, with high-functioning autism. Um, and I quite like facts, so having done a lot of disclosure, I will now calm myself down with some facts. Um, there are some tests you can do yourself uh, on this kind of stuff. These aren't diagnostic tests, they're just indicators. So here's my numbers, just in case you think I don't seem very autistic. Um, all right, so uh, this is the autism quotient test uh, created by um, Simon Baron Cohen at Cambridge. The dotted line is your neurotypical control group, and the, um, the dark line is people with diagnosed autism, and that's me. Um, and this is the RIPBO um, diagnostic scale, which is sort of preferred because you get really good interrater reliability with it. Um, so you can see here threshold values for suspected autism, 65, and I scored 155. I like that you're taking a photo of that. <laughs> like, wow, look how autistic this woman is. Um, anyway, so, so that's me. <laughs> I've never had anyone take a photo of that before. Um, so why should you care? Why should you care? Why should I care? Why should... So the more I looked at this stuff, the more I thought, God, do you know what? Some of the best people I've worked, in, I've worked with in IT show these traits. Some of the finest minds I've worked with show some of these traits. And obviously, people are, you know, different to each other and messy and all that kind of stuff. So even drawing back from the whole autism thing, let's explore that a little bit. So even in knowledge work, this is true, right? I don't really like the phrase knowledge work. Sorry, Dan, I know you used it yesterday, but because uh, it kind of, for me, conjures up this mental image that you've got people on a conveyor belt. Somebody goes, well, I know what, I'll put my knowledge in. And then it goes to you, and then you can put your knowledge in, and then if we add your knowledge at the end, we'll have a brilliant product. And that doesn't really sound like what I do when I'm doing IT or what other teams do when I watch them doing IT kind of stuff. Um, so I think you're also an artist. And your medium maybe isn't paint or music or sculpture, but it's actually something even less tangible and even more ephemeral than this kind of art. By necessity, when you're creating products, when you're solving problems that are tricky, you're being creative. And just in case you don't believe me, this is one of the standard definitions of creativity from a classic psychology textbook. Okay? Creativity is the tendency to generate or recognize ideas, alternatives, or possibilities that may be useful in solving problems. That sounds like the kind of thing we do every day. And if we're creative, then we probably need to understand the creative process a little bit. So this has been around since 1926, this model of creativity. 
and it's still really relevant today. So we have these different stages when we're being creative, when we're solving tricky problems. We have preparation, where we gather lots of information, where we understand the problem space. And then we have my favorite bit, which is, which is a period of incubation. A period of incubation, which is that bit when your subconscious kind of works on the problem without you directly thinking about it. And it's incubation that's in play when you've been up till 10, 11, 12 at night, almost bashing your head against the screen because you just can't work out how to solve a problem. You go to bed, you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, you're in the shower and you go, oh, it's so obvious, how did I not see the answer? That's because of the incubation process. And then we've, once we've got incubation, we have illumination, that like, yeah, I've got an idea, and then we can verify it. This picture, by the way, is called a luminarium. It's a, a pop-up space that is specifically used to help people creatively incubate. So you can walk around it, you can project colors on it, you can project textures on it, you can have sounds and smells inside it, and the idea is that it takes you into more of a creative mode by moving you away from that direct interaction that you're having with the problem space. I love incubation, I think it's fascinating. So I was thinking a little bit about, you know, different people have differing things that help them with incubation, that help them with creativity. Um, and even for just one single person, that can be pretty complicated. So I, I sent out to my lovely online community of, 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 of friends and colleagues and said, what are the things for you that apply tension on creativity? And I particularly wanted to say apply tension. So a little bit of these things can help you be creative, but if you've got too much of them, it can break your creativity. Okay, and these are all like knobs you can turn up and down for different people at different times to give the right kind of environment for creativity. And I just couldn't believe the amount of things that came up, but just some examples, or not. Things like deadlines, you know? If I've got no deadline at all, maybe I'm a bit directionless, but if I've got a deadline that's manageable, I can be creative. If I've got a really harsh deadline, then creativity is out the window process. Sometimes that could help me, sometimes it can restrict me. Distractions could be helpful or difficult. People and the kind of social stuff around me. Movement, be at your desk and look busy, busy or move around as much as you want, as freely as you want. Repetitive physical activity we know helps with creativity. Go for a walk, go for a run, do some juggling. Helps you solve the problem. Sensory environment, multitasking, politics, blah, 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 all of these different kinds of things helping to show us that irrelevant of neurodiversity. If we want to creatively solve problems, that's quite a bunch of stuff that we need to be thinking about. So this kind of, everyone's desk gets the same, here's the one environment we provide you to work in, and you stay there doesn't really help us with this creative process. And that's just one person. And we know that diverse teams solve problems better than teams that are the same. Right? Um, so this is, obviously, this is Justin Trudeau. Diversity isn't just sound social policy, policy, it's the engine of invention. And obviously, that's a politician, and you know, you don't necessarily need to take that as read, um, although it does seem to be a heaven knows a good kind of moment to be discussing that in the world, but there's heaps and heaps of research that shows that this is a good idea. There's a guy called Scott Page who has shown that you can actually model this with computational models and prove that if you get a diverse group, as long as it's a tricky problem and the group's smart, smart, but not the same, um, the diverse group will almost always outperform a group of experts. So you get a group of expert accountants working on an accountancy problem, and then you put in somebody from a different discipline, they're more likely to come up with a good solution. Um, and there have been some good recent studies on that too. Um, so some people were tested for uh, cognitive preference, different ways of thinking about things in, in a study recently, um, and then they were asked to uh, come up with a strategic solution that they could then go ahead and, um, and execute towards a very specific goal. Um, and the groups that were homogenous, the groups that were similar, very similar, 
um, not only didn't come up with a solution or a strategy, <laughs> when they were asked at the end of the day if they wanted to go home, they said, no, 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 we can solve this, stayed well into the evening and still weren't able to solve it. Whereas the, the groups that were, were more diverse were significantly faster at not only coming up with a solution, but being able to execute that strategy as well. Um, one more example. In 2008, a study was done with murder mystery uh, scenarios. So a bunch of interviews with potential you know, perpetrators of the crime were typed up and given to groups. And these groups were fraternity groups. Now, I don't understand what that means too much, because we don't really do that in the UK. But uh, my understanding is they're little cultural groups that support each other, that maybe help each other understand the social norms, but also help each other get on, uh, get on at work, you know, find opportunities for each other within both the community and the workplace and that kind of stuff. So they got the same fraternity groups of people. And they let them read through these things, these scenarios, and come up with a hypothesis on who do you think, who do you think, who do you think committed the crime? And for half of those groups, um, so a bit later, a newcomer came to each of the groups. For half of the groups, a newcomer was from a completely different fraternity group, and for half, it was the same fraternity group. Okay. And the accuracy and likelihood of coming up with the right answer more than doubled for the diverse groups. Okay, so that's interesting in itself, but my favorite thing about that is this happened even when the newcomer didn't have a different viewpoint, didn't offer any additional information whatsoever. So just by their very presence, they made the team more successful. And the thinking around that now is that it's because the collaboration wasn't quite so easy, because it had to slow down a bit. Uh, because it had to uh, be done a little more carefully, the outcome tended to be better in the diverse group. Okay. And we know that's true as well. So Google, I'm sure some of you know, did a big project called Aristotle when they were trying to work out what is the sort of magic ingredient for our really successful teams. And they looked at hundreds and hundreds of teams and found that the teams that were most successful were the ones where everybody's contribution was valued. OK, so that's diversity in general. And there are many types of diversity. Of course, I'm interested in gender diversity. I'm not going to talk about that, or racial diversity, or uh, LGBTQ stuff, or age, or whatever. I'm specifically going to focus now on neurodiversity. So neurodiversity is a word that was coined out of um, kind of autism awareness. And the idea of the word neurodiversity is that rather than thinking about things like Asperger's, autism, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera, as illnesses, as things we need to solve, as things we should try and eventually get rid of, we really should do better to think about them as just natural variations in the human genome that have always been there. They're not new. Um, and that rather than trying to solve them like they're problems, what we actually need to do is find environments where we can support neurodiversity. And in case you're thinking you don't know what that's got to do with you, um, if we just look at the numbers for autism, so the latest research in the States, one in 68 people has a diagnosis, so heaven knows if you include those that aren't diagnosed. Um, so it's pretty likely that if there's not someone in your team, there's someone in your department or certainly someone within your organization. And even neurotypical people can struggle with some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. And again, if you like the facts and numbers, because I know I do, there's loads of compelling evidence for this. Um, and this is just a little smattering, so you've got some examples. Uh, again, Marin Cohen, uh, 98. Um, autism occurs more often in families of uh, scientists. Mothers of autistic kids are li more likely to be technical. If you take two different regions in the same kind of area, you're more likely to get autistic children in the IT-rich region and autistic spectrum um, disorder 
students are more likely to choose STEM subjects than other subjects at college. So there definitely seems to be this link, and I think that's probably not news for most of us. So why? Why? So why do, why do I think why do I think this is a good thing? Why do I think you want people on your team? So this is Steve Silberman. He wrote this great book, Neurotypes, about the history of autism, and he also gives a great TED talk. Um, and he says that by autistic standards, the neurotypical brain is distractible, is obsessively social, and suffers from a deficit of attention to detail. So I kind of really like that. So he's flipped it around and said, you know, rather than looking at autism as struggling with these things, let's look at all the great things that, that, that autists find simple, that, but for other people are tricky. So well, how, is, how is, do I think um, this has helped me in my career? So, you know. There's for sure there's stuff I struggle with. I struggle with unstructured social situations, like cocktail parties and stuff. I'm never really sure when it's okay to leave a conversation and you know, join another one without being rude. I struggle in bright or dark sometimes um, environments. I struggle with certain kinds of textures. I don't like these things very much around my ears when I'm trying to talk, but I'm trying to do my best for you today. Um, okay, so. Why is it helpful in tech? Well, um, one of the things we know for... Oh, hang on. This, this is my... I need to say this first. These are all gross generalizations. There is not a characteristic like this is an autistic person. You, the saying in autis, autism circles is, you meet one person with autism, you've met one autistic person. So they're all sweeping generalizations. But often... Autists like repetitive tasks. I really enjoyed making that slide, for example. Um, and I think that's been really helpful in my career. So one time I was working on, um, I was, I was working on a, a, a CRM system for a bank. I was a small talk programmer, which is still the, the, the language I love the most. Um, so I was a small talk programmer. And um, I did some work. Um, on an error monitor, and um, we had a bug queue, a defect queue, that sat at around 120 to 140 things most of the time. And everybody would sort of take it on themselves, you know, when I finish a bit of work, I'll just try and pop a couple off the queue to keep it down a little bit, but nobody really liked working on the bug queue, apart from me. I loved the bug queue. I loved it. You could see the number going down as you solved the problems. I kind of got a bit obsessed with the number going down. And it was like solving these tiny little logic problems, which I've always loved. So when I finished my error monitor, I got put on the bug queue. I was delighted. Everyone else thought I was insane. I was like, can I be on the bug queue? And when I left being on the bug queue, the bug queue, the defect queue sat at, and it had never been this low before, well, presumably when they first launched the product, it was, but not that I could remember, sat around two or three non-reproducible errors. So the fact that I liked that repetitive task, and also the fact that everybody else on my team didn't assume, oh, we hate doing that, we're not going to let Sal do that because it's tedious. So I was like, no, 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 I really want to, I love it. So the diversity was really good there. Specialist interests. So often um, autists have specialist interests that they can intensely focus on. So um, this picture, this photo, is from Comic-Con in Exeter in England uh, last year. I walked past this table with all of these, I thought at the time, photographs on. Um, and I stopped because I quite like Doctor Who. So I stopped and I was looking at the Doctor Who one, and the guy behind the counter said, oh, um, uh, oh, these pictures that my son drew. And I was like, wow, I thought they were, they were photos. He said, no, 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 my son drew them. My son's autistic. So obviously we got talking, and I said, um, oh, oh, yeah, my son's autistic too. I think I might be a bit autistic. He said, yeah, my son... And then we started bemoaning the education system in England because it's really not set up for children who have different kinds of minds. Um, so he said, oh, yeah, my son, at the age of about 14, was being so badly served by the education system that he just stopped going to school. The teachers didn't mind. They couldn't cope with him anyway. So he stopped going to school. He hid away in his bedroom, and he drew. 
and he drew, and he drew, and he drew, and he drew. And he didn't show anybody particularly what he was drawing for about two years. And then, oh, it still makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up every time. And then his dad said, two years later, his son walked out of his bedroom with that, that he'd just drawn. Now, for sure, this is somebody who has an innate skill at drawing. Uh, you can see his work and buy his products, by the way. There's a link. Um, an innate skill. Um, and, and definitely, the artist was in there anyway. However, that repetitive ability to focus deeply um, on what he, was, what he was really fascinated with and wanting to get it right would definitely have served in helping him to do that. Um, another thing that um, is often the case, so Specialists in, specialists in autism think that you, there are different kinds of autistic mind. Um, and Temple Grandin, who, if you haven't heard of, I recommend you go look up, but she thinks that, and there's some evidence to show that, um, the special kind of autistic brain that's drawn to IT um, is very, very good at spatial awareness. It's very good at spatial thinking, physio-spatial thinking. So rather than having that photographic memory that's like, I can just look at a piece of text, put it to one side, and read it off the sheet in my brain, which is what Temple's brain does, she says the folk that seem to be drawn to IT are people who are really good at thinking about where things are in space. Okay. And probably my all-time favorite bit of research, which wasn't particularly anything to do with autism, was by a lady called Marion Petrie and a guy called um, Alan Blackwell, again at Cambridge. They took a bunch of expert designers, um, both self- and peer-rated experts, and they um, set them on a really, really, really tricky, horrible problem. And they said to them, I want you to talk us through how you're solving the problem. Just tell us what you're doing, you know, just talk to yourself as you go along. And so these designers talked and talked and talked and talked, and then after a little bit, they always went quiet. And when they went quiet, the researchers said, what's happening now? which must have been a little bit annoying, I think. So I said, what's happening now? And found that the designers started to describe these amazingly rich mental images that they had that they weren't even aware were there. They said things like, it's like a great bristling, multicolored scaffolding of pipework and gadgets floating in space. They said stuff like, it's like describing all the dimensions of the problem in 2D, but then there's this third dimension where I can sense closeness to a solution. They said things like, that happens over there, and I can fly over to it. So it seems like we're dealing with these visuospatial representations of the problem that maybe we don't even know are there, but they're helping us to problem solve when we're working on tricky problems and we're in this creative problem solving mode. All right, so that's autism. I just want to briefly, I'm less of an expert in these areas. My son does have a side order of ADHD. Um, three to four percent of adults in the UK have either ADHD or ADD without the hyperactivity. And I think when we, when we think about ADHD, we think about people who find it very difficult to screen out detail and focus. Don't we? They need low distraction workplaces and all that kind of stuff. What I didn't realize until relatively recently was that people with ADHD have this total superpower called hyperfocus. So if it's something that somebody with ADHD is interested in, they can focus in for longer periods of time and more intensity than your neurotypical person. So I would definitely want that person on my team. The other thing that people with ADHD are well known to be able to do is really good tangential thinking. And pretty much my favorite example of that is the idea that if, you are, if there's a group of school children learning about uh, photosynthesis in the classroom, your ADHD kid is the one that's looking out of the window going, I wonder if it still works in the rain. 
And I want that person on my team as well. I want that tangential thinking. If we're going to come up with creative products and solve the world's trickiest problems, we need these brains on our teams. Bipolar disorder. So my mother has bipolar disorder. She just came out of a hyper of a hypermanic episode and is just into a depressive episode at the moment. She's a slow swinger. So um, with bipolar disorder, the idea being your neurotypical brain will swing between, you know, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm really happy. And then with bipolar disorder, those swings are much more extreme and you can cycle through them quickly, which some people do, or in my mom's case, very slowly. Um, in the, in, the, in the manic state, which is the one that I'm going to talk about separately to depression, um, you get huge surges of energy. You really don't need to sleep very much at all. Uh, lack of sleep, extravagance, spending lots of money. My mom dyed her eyebrows pink last time, actually. So, you know, just doing this, not really not caring a jot for the conventions of society. Um, and being able to make links between things that to the neurotypical brain aren't linked at all. So often, um, but again, not always, people with bipolar disorder do this thing that people in the trade call clanging, which is like playing a word association game with yourself. Yes, yeah, so a word, a word, a word, a word, a word, a word. And to my brain, I'm like, how are these things related? Right. But to her brain, that's really, really annoying. She's like, keep up, keep up. Why can't you see the links? Why can't you understand? So I asked somebody in our industry, I don't know if I can scroll down to it now, um, who I know is bipolar, who's you know, excellent at the work they do, very well respected, and said, how do you think being bipolar helps you in your job? And they said exactly that. They said that when they're in a manic state, they can make links between things that other people can't see. And they know that those links often aren't reliable, so they learn, they've taught themselves to test them out with experiments. And so now that's what they do, even when they're not manic. They try and see unusual links and test them out with experiments. I want that person on my team. Depression. This is my bus. People who come to my talks like to see the progress of my bus over time. So there is a point to having a bus on the depression screen, I promise. So, uh, oh, I've got a statistic. 20% of people in the UK have experienced depression. I don't know about world, worldwide numbers, but I assume they'd be similar. Um, in a study of 1,000 eminent people, 77% of artists, 54% of fiction writers, 50% of visual artists, 46% of composers had had at least one significant depressive episode in their life. Wow. Okay. So, you know, it's hard to think, isn't it? How, how would depression be helpful on my team? Or how would that help? However, there's a great piece of research about depression. So, um, if you take a bunch of people, a bunch of neurotypical people or general cohort, um, and you ask them how good at driving they are, do you think you're in the top 50% or not? What do you think? Actually, I've never done this. What do you think? Hands up if you think you're in the top 50% for ability to drive your car. Yeah, there you go, which pretty much bears out what happens in the research, right? 93% of Americans think they're in the top 50%. Brilliant. Statistically impossible, and yet they do. And so there was some research done that said, let's take that even further. Let's only ask people who are hospitalized because of driving accidents that they've admitted were their own fault. And still, more than 50% of people thought they're in the top 50% for driving ability, which is crazy, right? Apart from one group, one group who had a balanced view of their driving ability, which is people who were clinically depressed. So I don't know what that says about the fact that people who don't have depression are maybe going through the life with this rose-tinted kind of attitude, but it seems to me that I want that person on my team because they're the person who's going to be saying to me, well, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. This seems a bit risky. Hang on a minute. Have you thought about all the things that can go wrong? 
I want that person on my team. Oh, that's the inside. <laughs> All right, so um, we know everyone's got different creative needs. How can they be creative, right? We know general diversity is good for teams. Hopefully, I've started to show you that neurodiversity is good for teams too. And yet, I keep hearing this. Oh, you know, we recruit for cultural fit. Hmm. You're not like me. Um, and I say, you know, uh, OK, you're the cultural fit, that you're in danger there of having a homogenous monoculture, everybody being the same. And when I say that to people, they go, oh, no, 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 Sal, I don't, think you can, I don't think you understand what I meant by cultural fit. Like, I didn't mean that we only recruit white, middle class, well-educated males who aren't very old. Well, you know. Maybe that's true, and maybe it isn't, and I don't really want to go there in this talk. Um, but know that if you're recruiting for cultural fit, you're playing right into the hands of some of your cognitive biases. All right. So here's just a few that are relevant, and there's more, but here's just a few. Salience. Salience is the fact that we notice like, the thing that's relevant for us right up front, and then we can't get past it. So say someone comes into an interview and they look different, or they sound a bit different, or they don't make eye contact with you. It's very hard for us to get past those things that have sort of smacked us in the face to the other stuff that we want to find out about. We kind of can't get past the initial thing. In-group bias. So this one's obvious, right? And you can see how evolutionary kind of point of view it's been really helpful. Right? We're going to protect the people in our group more than the people outside. Right? We're going to give preferential treatment to the people in our group. Makes sense. I love this one, though. Out-group homogeneity bias. Okay. So out-group homo homogeneity, homogeneity, I can't even say it, I'm so tired. Homogeneity bias is the fact that I perceive my group to be much more diverse than any other group. OK, so for example, let's say I go home tonight and I meet up with a bunch of mum friends from, you know, kids from, from, from my kids' school, and we sit around and we go, oh, isn't it funny? We're all really different. Look, you're a kind of career person, and I'm a stay-at-home mum, blah, blah, blah. But isn't it funny that all men like doing practical jobs and drinking beer, right? And whether you think you do that or not, we all do all the time. We consider our group much more diverse than the other groups that are out there. And I hear that all the time in my coaching. Oh, in IT, we do all different kinds of things. We're interested in different tools. You like doing business analysis. I like doing testing. But the business, like their one mind-melded blob, right, the business only care about making money. What? Really? <sighs> and if you didn't like that one, you'll love this one blind spot bias. So not only do we have these biases, one of our biases is our inability to see our own biases. So we all think everyone else is biased, but not me. <clears throat> OK. So what do people say when I say, tell me about cultural fit, and they say, oh, it's not about gender or race or anything else. They say things like, no, 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 so Sal. What I mean is, I want a flexible team player who's cross-functional and likes a challenge. Oh, OK. Well, what about if we took on some people who weren't like that? What benefits would we get from somebody who's not flexible? Well, maybe they're hard to convince, right? Maybe they really make us think it through. Maybe they help us avoid confirmation bias that Linda talked about yesterday. And what about someone who's not a team player? Well, maybe that will stop us kind of all polarizing together. Maybe it will stop risky shift, which is even more concerning than polarization in groups. It's the fact that if you've got a bunch of people together, and they're all sort of mildly right wing, and they all sit and talk about politics, they make these extreme right wing decisions. So the fact that the group's all similar makes them make these extreme decisions. And maybe having someone who's not a team player would help us with that. Maybe they'd be the person to come up with some maverick ideas that might just work. 
What about someone who's not cross-functional? Well, maybe they're the person who's got this deep encyclopedic knowledge and this absolute, almost, excess, uh, almost obsessive interest in something that we would definitely want on our team. Or what about someone who doesn't like a challenge? Well, maybe they highlight risks. Maybe they're careful and they think things through. So take care when you're thinking about these things. Take care when you say cultural fit. Take care to think about the people that you're screening out of your team. All right. So, and yet we talk about cultural fit. And yet we create environments like this. One size fits all. I cheated a bit. This is a newsroom or something. Somebody I spoke to about three weeks ago told me that they, their, their directors had decided they should go agile. And I said, how was that? What happened? And they said, well, they moved us to an exclusively open plan building. That's noisy and horrible, and we all hate it. Anything else happened? No, thank you. No, nothing else. That's all they've done. Moved us to a noisy, um, noisy open plan office. Crazy. So here's some neurotypical friends of mine and Catherine struggling with these workplaces we created. So these aren't even people with sensory issues or whatever. This is my friend Zoe. Um, she works in an organization where um, everything was modernized. Yay, we're all going to collaborate. Let's have really bright lighting and open spaces. She's like, that's great, but I get migraines. Her team made her a visor out of post-it notes so she could function at work. I don't want an environment where I can't get away and have to do that. This is a friend of Catherine's. Had to go and hide between two movable white boards to get some peace and quiet so she could work. I don't want to work in an environment where people have to resort to that. Okay, so what can we do? We can help be more inclusive when we interview people by not having panel interviews, by giving people really clear instructions about how to get to where they're going, how reception works, who to ask for, by taking a photo of the room and the interviewer so that there isn't too much to be shocked about when they turn up, by having the interview in a quiet place, by suggesting that it's okay if they want to bring props and things to fidget with, if that helps. And when I started thinking about this, I realized that actually what I like to do is TDD, or BDD <laughs> even, uh, my interview process. As soon as somebody walks through the door, wh what other things I'd be looking at to help this person succeed? Okay, I'd want them to shake my hand, or if they're uncomfortable, to, to know in advance they didn't want to shake my hand. I'd like them, so maybe I need to give them t tips about uh, first impressions, like dress code. Plenty of places today, you'd be more out of place if you did wear a formal suit than if you didn't. So that's easy to get wrong. And then I feel awkward. Is it okay to, I don't know, have a cup of tea or not or whatever? So trying to think of these things in advance, keeping interviews short, maybe having multiples of them over time than, rather than one intensive day. And there are companies out there doing all kinds of experiments with different kinds of interviewing methods and approaches that are, that are, that are kinder and more useful to people who aren't neurotypical. So continually busy, noisy, open plan spaces with nowhere to hide might not be the best option for everybody. Please offer alternatives. Provide a safe and forgiving environment that pays attention to people's individual needs without singling them out as strange. Think, realize that people will have different sensitivities to bright lights or sounds, um, to textures, taste, smells, unexpected things happening. Keep your meetings structured. Publish an agenda up ahead of time. Have a clear purpose. Let people know who's going to be there. Give people the opportunity to contribute by email or a written form, or we'll have somebody else be their voice if you want to during the meeting. And some of the things that we're doing now with the inclusive collaboration, we're helping people just um, stretch and practice using that muscle that um, psychologists call ex executive functioning which is what happens between us having that urge to make a noise, make my presence known, let everyone know I'm in charge, and something coming out of our mouth. So we're getting groups of people together in workshops to do things absolutely in silence, to practice being quiet so that we don't stifle each other a little less. 
Um, oh, that's fuzzy. I'm sorry. Um, and what we're doing is making prosthetic hands, because that's nice and tricky and a bit stressful, because they're really going to be used by somebody. So it feels like um, it's similar to a thing you might do at work. Obviously, it's a lovely thing to do as well, but it is quite expensive. You can run a science experiment with Lego or anything else that you'd like. Um, there's a book of experiments that you can do, which the science experiment's just one of. It's on Lean Pub. It's completely free. You can slide the slider to zero, and I won't mind, okay? Um, because I really want it to be out there. The thing with all this stuff, often after talks, people say, well, I've got this one guy on my team. What should I do? I don't have all the answers for you. I'm sorry, okay? But what I do have is, some examples, some tools, some experiments you can run, and some knowledge that you can go away with that you didn't have before. Or maybe you did. Maybe I'm just telling you what you know. All right, so some amazing things that I saw yesterday that I've kind of wrangled into here, because maybe you didn't go to all the talks on the IT and society track yesterday. It was really cool. Um, so I love this quote, and I think it's really relevant for this. Because we're trying so hard to move fast, Maybe we've forgotten some of the load-bearing walls that help us do this stuff in a democratic, kind, inclusive way. So that was from Jonathan and Steve's amazing talk yesterday. Dan, I made your name even brighter on the screen, Dan. Look at that. Uh, so Dan talked about uh, Ellie Goldratt um, and how to adopt a new technology using these four things. So I thought, I'll apply that to inclusive collaboration just in case my audience haven't got the message yet. So here we go. What's the power of the approach? Inclusive collaboration unleashes people's potential. What limitations does it diminish? Limited creativity and problem solving and blandness. What rules helped us manage the limitation before? Well, it was perceived economy of scale. You know, it's too hard to be inclusive. No one else is any good at it either, so we don't need to be good at it yet. And what new tools are we going to need? We're going to need to collaborate more carefully, and that's going to give us a competitive advantage and a humane advantage. Even if it feels a little bit harder to begin with, we need to experiment and learn together about this stuff. OK, Linda talked about moral foundations theory and how to give the message to people who aren't like you. I don't know if anybody missed that talk. Go look at it. It's really good. So I tend to be, you know, a bit, a bit on the liberal side, so I'm talking about care and harm and fairness and cheating and, and stuff like that, so I thought I'll experiment with some other ones. Loyalty. Inclusivity provides everybody with the opportunity to help the organization that we're proud to be a part of succeed. Inclusivity means we can all play by the same new rules. Inclusive collaboration upholds and supports everyone's human right to work. I've enjoyed playing with these things. I only learned them yesterday. Go play with them, they're ace. OK, so here's some studies you can go look at. Um, join the campaign, have a badge, have a sticker, find out about what we're doing, go experiment, have the book, let us know what you find out. I think it's a fascinating journey that we're all on. Thank you.